are going to go ahead and talk about a number of basic, really, principles behind what we're doing with nutrition. So specifically, we're going to be talking about dietary needs, how we're going to assess them. The government has its own versions of it, of effectively trying to say that, you know, we need this amount or that amount. And remember, the government's goals with nutritional intake is effectively to keep Homer Simpson alive. It's just to put down enough calories to keep you alive, not to help you thrive, not to help you effectively be the highest level athlete you could hope to be or otherwise. So we're going to talk about how we're going to read labels, how a lot of health claims can be on labels that are uh, what I would refer to as borderline fraudulent, wouldn't I take sticker? Wouldn't I guess? They're monsters sometimes. And then effectively, what is essential? How we define what's essential? So we have nutrients that if we do not get them in, we will die. Now, this isn't like some of them we could die in a couple of days, some a couple of weeks, some in a couple of months, depending on obviously body size and storage amounts. Isn't that right, Tinker Stinker? Isn't that right, Tinker Stinker? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So we then have our dispensable way of non-essential things, which just because it's not essential doesn't mean you're going to live a happy life without it, like carbohydrates. We're going to learn you don't actually need them in order to live. And then we're going to realize there's some things that are conditionally essential and conditionally indispensable. So it just depends on the situation. So if you see that flow chart on the bottom of the slide, you're going to see where essential units or essential nutrients are literally things that if we don't have them, we literally are not going to survive, we're not going to grow, or we're not going to effectively be healthy. Okay, Tinks, I know, bro, I know. You need to, are we, are we sick about it, Tinks? She's a good kitty, she's going on the floor. So I do not get whipped in the face by a tail as I'm trying to teach. Now, obviously our non-essential can become essential depending on certain situations. What that means effectively is some folks, thanks to genetics or otherwise, they need this specific nutrient because they are not able to process another one. And then non-essential, which once again, you can live the rest of your life without them and you'd be fine. And there's, there's a lot of latitude. We are effectively, effectively gonna find that we only have two fatty acids we need uh, about 10 essential amino acids that we're going to need along with about 15 uh, minerals and about 15 odd uh, vitamins and you'll be fine. Now, will you be happy? No, it'll be a very sad diet, but you can definitely survive over the long term with just that. So now, there's been a lot of attempts at trying to set effectively what is the amount of a given nutrient we need in order to avoid disease states. And so one that comes up a lot is what's gonna be known as the RDA. And this is something that was not developed until the 1940s, folks. So previous to that, it was kind of meh, you figure it out. And if you don't have enough, you get a disease, they give it a name, and then you figure out something fixes it. So how many of you guys are familiar with the disease scurvy? the disease scurvy? A little bit, but I don't really know. I don't know, like I don't know specifics, but I've definitely heard of it. And I know it's like a lack of something. Yes, it is a lack of vitamin C. And because of a lack of vitamin C, thank you, Kristen, you are going to have a lack of collagen production, which means your connective tissue is gonna break down. So sailors uh, specifically more of like Europeans during like the Renaissance and otherwise when they go sail across the world would get these sores and they could potentially die from it. And this is why if you guys were heard anyone refer to a British person as a limey because they would literally pack limes and eat the limes when they were traveling as a way to keep up their vitamin C levels and not to succumb to scurvy. A uh, lack of vitamin D will lead to something like rickets where you have literally weak enough bones and you can see uh, people that are bow legged because of it. And, you know, the, the list goes on as far as what is going to happen there. So the idea, as long as you're hitting the RDA, 95% of the population should have enough of a given nutrient that they're not going to show any of these issues of effectively a lack of intake. Now, you guys will also see on that graph where it says estimated average requirement this is going to be where 50% of the population 
will still present with some type of disease or some type of issue due to an inadequate intake of that nutrient, but 50% would be fine. Now on the far other side of this curve and the gap over here is way, way bigger than it makes it look in this graph is gonna be what's known as the tolerable upper intake level. So this is how much of anything you can take in in a given day before you're, start, you're gonna start seeing some type of toxicity. Like you can die of water intoxication. You've got to drink a lot of water really, really quickly and make sure that it doesn't have any electrolytes in there and you can, you can die of effectively hyponatremia. But that's obviously pretty darn rare. So dietary reference intakes, so this can be also known as a DRI. And this is going to you know, kind of be an umbrella of where we've got the estimated average requirement that's at 50%, the RDA, which is 95%, the adequate intake, which is going to be where we should in theory have nobody having issues, and then our tolerable upper intake level where that's where we're going to start to see issues with toxicity. Uh, an easy mineral to go into toxicity with is iron. Um, if you take too much iron at once, you go into iron overload and it, it's, it can literally kill you. Unfortunately, uh, this is why Flintstone vitamins typically don't have iron in them anymore because some kids would eat them just because they like the taste, which is different to say the least. But unfortunately, a couple kids, and this, is, this is back when I was a child, died of effectively iron overload from acute poisoning of taking in too much. So different countries have their own values. Now you got to keep in mind, we're looking at dietary reference values. There's going to be both, you need to take in at least this much, but you also need to make sure that you're not going over this level. So hence total fat and saturated fat, it's more about staying under, but we're going to get into the nuances there once we talk about fat directly. Same thing with cholesterol, though dietary cholesterol, unless you have some specific genetic mutations really has little to no bearing on your actual blood cholesterol levels. Fun fact of science. Um, your fiber intake, that's, you know, a number we're looking to try to be over. You don't technically need fiber in your diet, but you'll probably appreciate it because you won't feel like you're trying to pass a brick through your bowels. Then we have obviously our electrolytes. So these are minerals of sodium, potassium of where we want to make sure we're getting in not too much of sodium because your average American takes in too much. But sodium is interesting in that it's not sodium bad. It's more nuanced in that sodium itself, you've got some folks that doesn't matter how much salt they get in their diet will not change the blood pressure whatsoever. You have some other folks that whenever they take in too much sodium, obviously their blood pressure goes up and it's really bad. But then you have some folks that have a paradoxical reaction, which is a high sodium diet actually decreases their blood pressure. Now, don't get me wrong, percentages wise, it ends up being like over 50% of the population, almost a third of the population, and then like not even 10%. So obviously it's a little more nuanced, hence they usually just say, just decrease sodium in your diet. Because if you guys really, when you do your dietary projects and you start tracking those nutrients, and remember that's due at the end of the semester, you're going to learn our average person takes in a lot of sodium. And then of course, the good old protein of trying to take that in at about 0.8 uh, grams per kilogram of body mass per day, which then scales differently depending on how big you are. And then we can get into some interesting conversations also with how much lean mass you have accrued in general. So there's a lot of things going on when it comes to just basic healthy diet. So at the end of the day, we want to make sure we're getting in a variety of different food sources. We should hopefully, and I like how it's grayscale, so you can't see it as well. Um, the my plate, and obviously my pyramid is the earlier iteration. The food guide pyramid, when you know I was younger, was just kind of that grains at the bottom. Then you had your vegetables and fruits, and you had your dairy and your protein, then you had your sweets. And people thought you wanted to be at the top of the pyramid, so they thought, I guess you need sweets instead. And it's kind of a bit of a foster clock. In reality, what we're going to obviously get into is your diet should serve whatever your performance goals are and your health goals. So if your goal is just to be healthy, eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, eating enough carbohydrate to support whatever activities you enjoy, and then same thing with eating enough protein to support the activities you enjoy and eating enough fat to maintain your overall health. And then from there, kind of have at you. you know. Whereas, when it comes to the plate, it's a little bit easier because you can kind of visualize 
different percentages of your plate being filled up with fruits and vegetables or grains or meats, et cetera. The basic idea, and we're gonna find be the reoccurring theme is just trying to find a way to convince people to eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, specifically vegetables. And just so we're clear, potatoes, corn, those are more starches than they're a true vegetable, even though obviously they've got a lot of uh, potassium in them and some other nutrients, so specifically when it comes to potatoes. But if we're looking for a caloric yield, uh, you're not getting a whole lot from kale and broccoli, though that's going to have a lot more positive effects on your health. And then obviously some other parts in there, which is the whole be physically active. It doesn't mean you need to lift weights, doesn't mean you need to be a long distance runner. You could do hula hooping for cardio. Cool, I don't really care. The basic idea is you have some type of physical practice because like anything else, you do need some type of physical practice, A, to maintain your overall health and vitality, but also for even things like good old neurological functioning. And the other basics you'd see, which is, don't the fat we're gonna get into, but trans fat for the most part is just all bad. You should really avoid that. Aiming for more high fiber foods, making sure that we're trying to avoid caloric laden beverages, specifically things that just have a lot of sugar in them. And definitely trying to drink either not much at all or not at all. And then when we say practicing food hygiene and safety, this is something that everybody should work on in that you're just making sure you prepare your foods to appropriate temperatures, you store things in appropriate conditions. So that way you're not going to ever get a, a little bit of the old dysentery or otherwise, which took out a lot of humans only a couple generations ago. And even then, you know, diarrhea is a major cause of infant death throughout the world. So, and yeah, probably try not to throw down a lot of extra additives and nutritional supplements and just try to focus more on whole food and just be mindful of where you get your food. But that's kind of getting an ethical eating, which we'll, we'll get into. So now one thing to keep in mind, guys, is in America, the way that they set up uh, uh, our, reading, our labels is, is crap. I really don't like it because they figure Americans don't like math. So they go ahead and they round the heck out of everything. So you never get the true numbers where other countries, they actually give you to the 10th. And we're going to talk about how that's a big issue when it comes to health claims later on. So we have here is a box of mac and cheese. And so when we're reading a, a label, the first thing that we're going to go ahead and do, guys, is always start off with a serving size. So this is one cup of mac and cheese. So the container is two actual servings. Now, a lot of people would probably consider this to only be one serving or would eat two boxes of this for a meal. So instead of getting 250 calories, now we're talking 500 or 1,000. So that's where things get interesting. So once you have your serving size, we look at the calories, we get an idea of, okay, what's going on as far as caloric yield. From there, let's look at our macronutrients. So as we're gonna, once again, we're not there yet, but we're gonna get an idea of like, okay, we're gonna get this many grams of carbs, of fats, of protein. And so obviously when you look at this food in general, most of the calories are going to be coming from, or really we're getting the, the lion's share of the calories from fats and carbs, and they're relatively equal. Protein is only giving us a grand total of 20 of those calories. So effectively we're getting about 120 calories of carbs. And well, we're going to do the math in a second and realize that the math they do is garbage. And then we're going to look at our micronutrients. Now, obviously listed here is only four of them. Those are more indicative ones that people are more likely to have inadequate amounts of, but obviously being mindful of that, we're going to get enough of each of those micronutrients over the other day. Then let's look at some other things. Let's look at the ingredients. Let's maybe be interested in the sourcing. Now, obviously, before we go into breaking down the numbers, what do you guys think would be some examples of times you would go ahead and not start off with reading the serving size or reading the calories? What do you guys think would be some examples? Hey, what's up, Bahamut? You doing good, buddy? The second cat is possibly going to say hello, but he's, he's chill. I like him. Tinks, Tinks is a bit of a dumb dumb. Absolutely, Kristen. If you have a food allergy, if you're allergic to 
gluten, if you're allergic to peanuts, if you're allergic to soy, you want to find out real fast because you're going to learn that, okay, this is a no-go or yes, this is something that I can go and purchase. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. You good? Sorry. This is Bahamut. He's the first cat that my wife and I ever got. He's nine years old and he's about a buck 10 and, you know, or <laughs> buck 10. No, that's not right. He's 15 pounds. Yeah. Of love and life. What else aside from food allergy? What would be some other reasons we'd start somewhere else? Yes, if someone is a vegan or vegetarian and they want to make sure the food that they're eating doesn't have any animal products in it. Absolutely, Katie. Absolutely. What else? What else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Keep thinking it through. There's going to be a multitude of reasons why we do certain things. Yes, they're on a special diet. You've got somebody that might be diabetic. Yes, you're trying not to exceed an upper limit or you have an issue with not enough iron in your diet or otherwise. So you're actively trying to make sure that you're getting in enough of those micronutrients. Sorry, the cat is literally rubbing his head up against my backside trying to get attention. So great job, guys, great job. So let's go ahead and break down this label, okay? So the first thing we've got is it's got 12 grams of fat. Now, how many calories are in one gram of fat? How many calories in one gram of fat, guys? Great job, absolutely nine. So 12 times nine is gonna give us a grand total of 108. So notice the calories from fat is already a lie. It said 110 because they like to round things because they're lazy. So then we've got 31 grams of carbohydrates. How many calories per gram of carbohydrates? Great job, great job guys, four. So. 31 times four, now we've got ourselves a grand total of 124 calories from carbohydrates. And then finally, we've got five grams of protein. How many calories per gram of protein? Actually, it's 5.1, that's a trick question, but it gets metabolized to four grams per, or four uh, kcals per gram because of the energy it takes to digest protein. I have a master's in nutrition. That was an unfair question for me to ask. But five grams of protein, multiply that by four, and now we've got a grand total of 20 calories. So if we add all that together, we've got a grand total of 252 calories. We have all of a sudden gotten two extra calories and somehow with an overestimation of two calories from fat because America, we don't like math and the metric system is for communists. But just keep that in mind, guys. Whenever you're looking at the labels, there's always some rounding. And that, once again, is something that irks me, but it's something that we're going to go ahead and spend a little bit more time later on. But does this make sense as to when we're looking at the labels, start off with that serving size because we're gonna contextualize everything else that comes down from there, okay? How many calories or how many how big is that serving that we're actually getting in? So the first little breakout room that we're gonna have you guys do tonight and looking at serving sizes, okay? We're going to have a field day with making fun of cereal serving sizes. So what I'm gonna have you guys do is just find out and this is gonna be just real quick. We're having you guys work in two groups. You're going to go ahead and tell us what is a serving of said cereal. 
So like, what is the actual size of a serving? Okay. One second, I got to yell a little bit louder. Hey, honey, Lauren, how big, how many uh, cups would you say is a normal like bowl of cereal, like on like ads and stuff? Like probably three or four cups of that cereal. Okay. My wife's a dietitian. She's the smart one. Well, not that smart. She is married to me. We, we all make mistakes. But what I'm going to have you guys go ahead and do is figure out what is the serving, but then figure out the total calories in three total cups of that cereal along with the carbohydrates, fat, and protein, just the cereal, not including the milk, not including the milk that you might add. Yes, fiber does count as energy, Kristen. It actually gets metabolized into short chain fatty acids by the uh, bacteria inside of your digestive tract and you utilize that for energy. And that is gonna come in typically closer to like two, uh, two grams uh, or two kcals per gram. So it's not as much of a caloric yield. Okay, so now in the chat, guys, I want you guys to give me, let's go with five different uh, cereals, five different cereals that you guys like. Okay. Look at you. So group one is going to be Fruity Pebbles. Group two is gonna be Frosted Flakes. Group three, come on guys. We've only got two cereals out there. Lucky Charms, there you go, Trendon. You guys ever wanna hear a funny story about Lucky Charms and how I'm a spiteful person? Ask me about that when you see me in person because I'm not gonna leave that on the internet. Rice check. Come on, Kristen. At least give us some flavor. Oh, good. Cocoa Pebbles. I'm throwing that up there, Dalton. Oh, we already got Fruity Pebbles. So is there like any other type of like cocoa type? And yes, yeah, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Sounds good. Ah, screw it. We don't. No. Give me something else in the vein of like the, of a chocolate type cereal. Perfect. Cocoa Puffs. Perfect. Thank you, guys just because I imagine the products are going to be. And then finally, group five, you guys have got Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Awesome. So let me go ahead. I'm going to throw this up in the chat. You guys know what you're looking for. You guys are in charge of obviously doing the math. So if like one serving is half a cup, then you're actually doing six servings and then, okay, you got to multiply the calories by six and everything else by six. And we'll go ahead and come back. It's 623. We'll come on, plan to come back um, around 630 or a little bit before then. So have fun, guys, and get after it. Your calories or your si original serving size, then obviously the amount of servings it would actually take to fill up three cups and then the total carbs, fats, and proteins. So just one person from each group, go ahead and put that in the group chat. Didn't mean to do that, I accidentally hit the wrong button. You're good, Jared, no worries. Really, Kristen, three cups of Lucky Charms would only be 420 calories. Wow. Good. Brent, that looks good. The key is what was your, uh, what was your um, cereal? Hmm. I'll be darned. It's a lot lower than I would have expected.
Thank you, Brian. I have totally messed this up. That's okay. Trying to, I, I tried to space like to hit enter to move that down and it sent the thing. But it's okay. Just you can hit comma otherwise it's no worries. But we're still waiting on uh, two more groups anyways. Um, that calorie count looks a little crazy. Um, I thought so too, but for one ounce, it would be, there's eight ounces in a cup. Would I multiply that by 24 for three cups? Holy crap. What was your guys' uh, what was your group? Fruity Pebbles, group one. Damn. Hmm. All right. That's a lot of carbohydrate. All right, Tori. All right, John. And John and Tori, what was your guys' uh, cereal? Nice. All right. So yeah. that's why, obviously, when we have the basic information of the serving sizes, we need to think about like, okay, there's the serving size that they give you, and then there's actually how much someone will eat as one serving. And so, I mean, you look on the side of Gatorades where it's supposed to be like two to two and a half servings per bottle, and like, no, nah, that's. That's one workout, that is not more than one serving. So there's some subtleties of how you hide and we're gonna to get to that in a few moments. Now, when it comes to the food guide pyramid, I just like making fun of this table from your book because it turns out, yeah, that uh, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, iron, yeah, you can get that from meat, you can get that from liver and you can get most of that also from pretty much, excuse me, a lot of your vegetables but we're gonna make it sound like we need cereals for it. Not dog, you know. Then we come to dairy products because you know what's awesome? Enslaving an entire female species and then keeping them permanently lactating and then stealing their lactation after you've taken their child from them. Also so we can murder that child when it's still young and has very soft muscles because we love veal. But it's important that we as humans are just mindful of the way that we treat animals and how we treat each other. So you can, yes, calcium, it is a good source when you go with dairy. So are plants, because that's how cows get the damn calcium in the first place, from plants. Um, protein, obviously you can still go meats, you can still go vegetarian if you really want, we've got options there. Yes, those are great sources of protein and otherwise, cool. Yes, vegetables are great sources of vitamin A, C, and pretty much every other vitamin. Mushrooms are actually sources of vitamin D. That's kind of fun. And then fats, oils, and sweets, because we all know that we like to separate with or supplement with Oreos so we can get vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E is going to be something you're naturally going to find in a lot of your oils, so specifically your more vegetable oils, uh, tocopherols and otherwise. Uh, vitamin A, it's called carrots. That's really a good source of them and otherwise. <laughs> And then we've got the joys of vitamin D, which we should try to get that from the day star, but that requires obviously A, being outside enough with enough skin exposed and having a light enough pigment that you're gonna be able to convert it effectively pretty efficiently. And that's why people with my type of uh, skin uh, pigmentation is specifically my dad and my sister they are not meant to live near the live in places where the sun is all day. They're meant to be in places that are permanently overcast because they nearly burst into flame with direct sunlight. Don't worry, they're not day walkers, but they're relatively close. 
So in all seriousness, if you're looking for true caloric yields and also make sure you're hitting all of your micronutrients, if you ever find yourself in a legit like survival circumstance, eat the freaking liver and effectively most of the internal organs, probably not the intestines for obvious hygienic issues of an animal that you happen to get because that's actually where you're going to find a lot of vitamins and minerals. And then obviously otherwise foraging for plants. So this, this table should make you angry. It should upset you because this has a solid dose of lies. Okay. So I want you to, instead of read, and we'll, we'll start off at the top. Can you guys see this well enough? Like it's a big enough size. You want me to zoom in on the slide so you can see it a bit better. Okay. So. Uh, let's go to hunger. Okay, now notice we're just only looking at a super zoom in of calorie free and fat free. Okay, now remove the word calorie and replace cyanide and remove fat free or fat and replace it with anthrax. Now, reading it this way, does it really sound like it doesn't have any cyanide or anthrax in it? No, it doesn't. Kind of seems a little foolish, doesn't it? But this is one of the major things you need to keep in mind when you're looking at claims for nutrition on labels. It can say something is not just calorie free, but sugar free. And as we're going to learn, also even things like trans fat free when it is not, in fact, trans fat free it still has a small amount because it's less than 0.5 grams. So it can be 0.49. And then those servings are really small, like the fruity pebbles. So when you eat 10 servings of it, you now have had 4.9 grams of trans fats in a day. Though reading the labels, you would think, oh, there's no trans fat, it's healthy. And uh, if we were, in, po if we were you know, in a classroom and I wasn't recording this, this is where I, quote uh, Marilyn Manson and a couple other uh, very vulgar musicians for their language because it does upset me deeply because it's lies and I'm not a big proponent of them. So that's the thing to keep in mind, guys. When something says it's fat-free, sugar-free, calorie-free, no, no, no. It's low enough that they can round it because we have low standards here, okay? Now, reduced means we decreased one component or the other. And that's great because typically when you reduce one thing, like the fat, the sodium, or the carbohydrates, what do you do instead, honey? Oh, when something says it's reduced uh, with fat, what does it typically mean they did? Bingo. They've added in more carbohydrates or added in more sodium. So it's you're, you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul half the time. And... Yes, then we've got things like low, and that's actually a better approximation of what's going on, but by golly, yeah, yes, low-fat peanut butter is A, soulless in the first place, and B, yeah, you're definitely getting a lot more sugar in there because they have to add something in there to make it taste better. We, and I'm speaking mostly for American cuisine, are so used to hyper-palatable foods, things that taste freaking great. I mean, that's why I gave you some trouble at the very beginning. Uh, Kristen, when it comes to giving rice checks, I'm like, why eat rice checks when you can eat frosted flakes? Like, all I want is essentially a delivery mechanism to hold the sugar that I want to eat because America and diabetes. Anyways, I'm not trying to. Okay, I'm on the soapbox. Let's keep moving. Questions there about nutrient content claims and why we need to be aware of it. 
So there's a number of food claims that are allowed. And this can unfortunately be extrapolated into weird uh, quasi locations, like when it comes to uh, fiber and effects on cholesterol levels. So that's why the Cheerios box has, it's a heart healthy food because there's like two grams of fiber. And like, you know, it has a lot of fiber and they don't bother saying it's a heart healthy food. Cauliflower, broccoli, every single vegetable there. They don't have to slap labels on it to make you be like, oh, you're making a good choice. Instead, it's a marketing tool and it's something unfortunately that it can be very misleading. People, a lot of people, you know, when they have health and fitness goals, they're not thinking, you know, it'd be fun to be deluded and to make no progress. Instead, they think, oh, these people are making good faith claims. They're doing their due diligence for the research and things are above board and being done ethically. And then unfortunately, things are a little bit different than that. So like anything else, guys, you have to be an informed consumer and you have to think through effectively what is really going on with the foods and are they making appropriate claims. Now, the folic acid and birth defects Absolutely true. You want to avoid neural tube defects and otherwise you need to make sure you're getting a folate. That's why if you are female and you choose to at some point have a child, you do need to make sure you stay on top of not just your macronutrients, but your micronutrients. And that can be a real SOB depending on how bad your morning sickness, which unfortunately, I hate to break it to you ladies, sometimes morning sickness should really be defined as day sickness because that's kind of how you feel all day. Sorry about that. Sugar and high amounts is definitely not good for your teeth. That's pretty straightforward. Eating a diet more with fiber seems to have positive effects on decreasing cancer risk. Now, it's kind of a hard or correlation and causation we talked about last time because, well, if you're eating a lot more food, that happens to be fruits and vegetables and whole foods, it turns out you're naturally going to have a lower fiber. Now, the saturated fat and cholesterol, that seems to be, it's not as much as a link as one would suspect. It's more of kind of the sources of the saturated fats, just like obviously high trans fat is gonna be as bad, as bad you should avoid that. So now I'm sure some of you guys have heard uh, some demonization of different food additives such as using uh, sucralose, uh, aspartame, sorbitol, and different types of sweeteners, which to be fair, it's the research out there as far as how much you have to take to really have a negative health outcome is pretty darn high. Now, if you're pounding down eight two liter bottles of diet soda per day, and then you're like, well, but I'm not drinking the eight liters of soda any day. Like, yeah, that's better. But you know, what's the better option of those two. The third option, just don't drink eight two or four two liter bottles of, of soda in a day, just, just drink water. Um, be careful of uh, a false dichotomy where people make it seem like there are only two options. We have a lot more options than that. So the key thing is whenever we process foods, in a number of ways, we make that food actually much easier to digest and we can actually get nutrition from it. So this is the reason why you don't hear, or you don't have as much of an issue with a bunch of animals trying to break into and essentially chow down on a wheat field. But you do have that problem with pests and more of your typical gardens that have fruits and vegetables because it turns out those don't really need much processing in general. You can go ahead and go straight for it. Uh, cooking food makes things easier to break down. You know, I'm sure a couple of you guys have tried to do a relatively raw cuts of meat before in your life. And especially if we're talking about like red meat, that can be a lot harder to eat as opposed to if you've you know, prepared it correctly so that it effectively the collagen is broken down. So it's literally that much easier to uh, chew and swallow and break down. Now, it is an important thing, and this is kind of beyond the reach of this class, which is we are made up of obviously the foods we eat. The foods we eat are made up of the foods that they ate or the conditions they grew in. So one of the issues you have with a lot of factory farming and then obviously in turn the factory feedlots for the animals is effectively the soil can start to get depleted of certain minerals. And that lack of minerals then is a lower amount of minerals in the animal you ate or a lower amount of minerals in that vegetable you ate. And because of that, it's actual yield of those nutrients are not as high as you would have suspected. And so because of that, 
now we're going to go ahead and potentially have some issues with uh, health. There's some arguments about obviously pesticides and otherwise being used and still somewhat being on the foods that you're eating. That's, that's still something that has to be there. But at the end of the day, make sure you have an interest in effectively where the foods that you eat came from. You know, are you comfortable with the ethics behind everything that has gone into your, the preparation of your meal, you know? Yeah, yeah, genetically modified organisms are a great thing. Uh, it was Borlaug, I think it's Norman Borlaug was the gentleman that first really hybridized wheat and otherwise and really increased food yields and has saved the lives of untold billions of individuals. So genetically modified organisms are a great way to increase yields. However, the potential drawbacks there is, you know, A, obviously you're playing around with some physiology of plants and animals that we don't maybe fully understand yet, but more of the monoculturing is kind of my concern, which is so like, you know, all of us watching this right now, we're all human. Um, it would be really cool if an alien's watching this right now or watching this years from now. Hi, I'd like to meet you. But what you're going to find is all of us have about 99 point, like 9999% of our genetics in common. And that essentially hundredth of a percent is what, or 10th of a percent, depending on really some wild differences, is what gives us really big differences. And obviously how we're built, how we think, how we function, you know, we all are still human, but obviously, you know, if I was standing next to Shaquille O'Neal and then Peter Dinklage, so you could like see Shaq's shoulders and I would tell you Peter Dinklage was here and you wouldn't even realize it. And then we're just, we're guys, we all have a Y chromosome in common. And obviously that's excluding, you know, over 50% of the population with women in same type situation. If you had like Simone Biles, you'd maybe see the top of her head. And then, oh crud, I can't think of the name of the, um, those two ladies in beach volleyball that like have torn up the world for like over a decade. Anyways, so all human, but we have that variability. Carrie Walsh, thank you, John. Great job, buddy. And so the key thing is, is all of us are different and we then have different immune systems. So like look at COVID-19. Obviously, it looks like the mortality rate is you know around 3%. Great job, Brent. Good job, guys. Um, where we've got variability. So you have some people that have obviously had COVID that are completely um, asymptomatic carriers. So they got the disease, the virus is in them, but they don't have any issues. And then you have other folks that it levels them, you know, obviously, unfortunately kills them. Some folks have major complications post COVID. So they've got effectively diminished cardiovascular function, uh, uh, pulmonary function, all because of a little virus. And so thanks to the genetic vi variability, no matter what, no matter how bad people are with social distancing, mask wearing and vaccine application, a certain percentage of the population is going to survive. And obviously for this disease, it's pretty high. Um, unfortunately, I know Ebola when it was actually transmitted by um, unfortunately needle, that's a longer story. It had 100% uh, mortality, nobody survived it. But this one, much higher survival. Now the problem is, be there in one second, Haley, great question. When it comes to GMOs is you have effectively the same organism. So if it's a disease that's lethal to one of them, it's gonna get probably, or not, it has a chance of literally taking out all of them. So you lose the entire crop yield for that year. And that obviously can be pretty damn catastrophic. So an example of a food that is processed to improve its nutrition, wheat. If you didn't crush wheat into flour, you're pretty much just gonna have a hard time passing that seed through your GI, it's going to be a little uncomfortable. So, you know, that's going to be one food that obviously we cook and modify to have an effect. I don't think any of you guys want to try to eat plain rice that hasn't been cooked yet. Um, a number of vegetables, when you cook them, you actually make it so it's easier to effectively um, take down the minerals inside of it but you lose some of the vitamins because you effectively cook them out. So you kind of have a plus and a minus there. A lot of meat, it just becomes much easier to digest whenever you happen to have essentially processed it through heat and cooking. And obviously things like chicken, you keep it from giving you salmonella. So you've broken, uh, so you effectively killed the bacteria on it that would be very highly pathogenic to you. 
does that kind of answer your question, Haley? Yeah, I guess like I didn't think about once we have the food that we we're also doing that in a sense. It just I don't know. That just did, I didn't think about that. So sorry about that. No, 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 no. It's absolutely fine because you got to keep in mind. Yeah, processing notice, guys. That's a wide variety of things. Anything from adding preservatives, so it's going to stay on the shelf stable for a longer period of time. Canning food obviously is a form of processing it. And you lose a little bit of the vitamins. They're going to break down over time to the vegetables, but turns out it's just going to be a lot more shelf stable. So you've got that waiting for you. That's the whole, you know, prepper side of it. And then obviously we can do things like obviously improve the taste, um, improve the nutrition, like fortifying milk. That's why you see A and D, those vitamins are added to it. Um, obviously color is added to a lot of different things. Texture is an important one because some folks have got issues with different types of food textures they really don't like and or they have difficulty chewing and swallowing. So they actually need to have foods of an appropriate texture, uh, essentially just solid enough that they can kind of have something to it to swallow. And they even, some folks need to have water literally thickened for them. So they're gonna be able to drink it because otherwise they literally have a hard time uh, swallowing appropriately. So don't be af afraid of processing, just ask better questions. Like, okay, what are we doing when we say we're processing this food? Like what, what's really going on here? Because, you know, like anything else, companies are there to make money. And it doesn't mean they're always gonna do the most ethically, but they're there to make money. So they probably don't wanna kill all their customers. Uh, sometimes they just want to, you know, poison them, but poison them in a way that they like it so they do it more frequently, like the entire alcohol industry. So fat substitutes were a uh, thing uh, many, many years ago. They're not as popular anymore. Olestra was one of them. It's effectively an interesting fat molecule that has like a bunch of little tails going off it. So you still get the palate taste of fat, but the problem is, is your body can't break it down, which effectively it oils up your insides if you have enough of it, and it gives you really, really bad diarrhea. So I would thoroughly suggest never being, uh, trying to effectively do a lot of uh, Olestra, uh, unless you like perhaps being MC disaster pants, then have at you. Now, the next thing, or the first thing we really need when we're working with anybody is really just look at their diet. You know, we need to get an idea for like, okay, what have they taken in? What are some foods they've taken frequently? What does effectively their normal day look like? So the longer we test for three-day food record, seven-day food record, okay, now we're gonna have you record for this period of time. This is good because one of the issues whenever we go with the 24-hour recall is we count back what you guys have done over the past day. And actually that's something we're gonna do as an activity in a few moments. So, you know, people are going to be able to under, or they're going to under or overestimate how much they ate. And what you typically find your average person underestimates how many calories that they're taking in and overestimates how many calories that they're burning. And it tends to actually be worse with people that are overweight uh, and obese. Now, a food frequency questionnaire is just a good thing to go off because you're like, okay, here's the foods that these people typically tend to like to eat in their given life. And it gives you some ideas of, okay, like here's the things we can go and introduce. Like if someone does effectively uh, McDonald's for every single meal of the day, telling them that they're going to start their day with a kale smoothie and then have a nice, you know, quinoa arugula salad for lunch, they are going to lose their freaking minds. Instead, we might literally start with, okay, okay. You're used to McMurdering your GI all day long. So for breakfast, you're going to do what would effectively be like, I don't know, the egg sausage burrito or whatever. Lunch, you're gonna do, you know, a cheeseburger, but I want you to do the side salad. Dinner, you know, same thing. And then eventually try to work them over into, you're gonna do the salad. And, and you just slowly, slowly kind of turn the ship. And obviously diet history, once again, is just kind of giving you some ideas of, you know, what does that person typically do over, you know, the long span of time? So like anything else, they have their pros, they have their cons, nothing is perfect. Your prospective methods, mean tracking them as they go forward, is always going to be a better method than retroactive because like anything else, people's memory can tend to be a little fuzzy. Um, you know, for example, just throw up in the chat, guys, what you guys had for breakfast 
on January 2nd. Whenever you guys are ready, go and throw it up there. And I appreciate your honesty, Nathan, because I won't tell you what I had for breakfast uh, on January 2nd. Now, if I ask you guys what you had today, you guys probably remember that. And obviously, if I ask you yesterday, you might remember, but the, <laughs> the serving size might be a little bit off. I really hope that we drink water at some point. I've just been living on nothing but Everclear because, you know, water makes you weak, right? I'm kidding. Okay. So what you guys are going to go ahead and do, we've got 18 of you guys. So great, that gives us 17, the numbers don't work out. We're gonna have one group of three. The rest are gonna be groups of two. You guys are just going to tell your partner, okay? What you ate today, okay? Trying to break it down to the best of your ability. You and your partner are then going to go ahead, so effectively, Oh, so Lucas, are you using my fitness pal? Ah, there you go. Yeah, so you'd be an easy person to work with. Notice though, in the total class, not a whole lot of people are on your level and that's okay. You're gonna be working with your folks. We're gonna talk about the difference between the essentially the baker, the cook, and the chef approach to nutrition as we go. But right now it's pretty much seven o'clock. I'm gonna give you guys till 7.10. So obviously type out there what you did. So you got Lucas's example right there. So what I would then do is literally Google, you know, how many calories in, you know, two servings of oatmeal, which now there's a lot of variability in the different types of oatmeal. You can always ask a follow-up because you're going to be able to talk back and forth. You know, how many calories in two cups of Greek yogurt? Was it a plain group Greek yogurt to have flavor to it? What was the size of the banana? How big were the eggs? Were they ostrich eggs? Were they robin eggs? But go back and forth, talk your way through it, and then just try to come up with a good guesstimate of total calories. Now, once you do the total calories, guys, I want you then to go ahead and effectively make up, sorry, a breakdown of effectively the calories they would have had to take in that day with the estimation of, okay, they've got this much of A, this much of B, this much C. And then one other nutrient could be the total grams of protein, total grams of carbohydrate, total grams of fat, just go for it. Doesn't bother me what you guys go with, but we're gonna go ahead and come back and talk through what you guys came up with. So be ready to go ahead and paste in. They had this many calories and then this many grams of sugar. They had this many calories, this many grams of fat. And from there, we're gonna go ahead and talk out a little bit more. We don't have to have their full nutritional breakdown though use the power of the Googles to make that relatively easy to make that happen. So we've got one group of three, otherwise we've got a bunch of group of two. Have fun with each other, no judgments of people's diet. Um, if they had alcohol, alcohol is seven kilocalories per gram. And so if they were boozing on a Thursday during the day, well, maybe Wednesday night got late, as long as you're social distancing when you're out. So have fun, guys. Choose to eat dinner while we're giving lecture, because I find that would be, you know, a perfect thing to do when we're obviously talking about nutrition. But uh, wow, wow, guys. Okay, okay. Randall's partner is getting something in. Nice. Hey, it's all good. It's all good. No worries, Alex. And nice, Allie. And good job, Randall. Way to break down the fat side of it. Ah, 
while. Some of you guys just did breakfast. That would be the reason why the calories were a slight underestimate. Now you understand why I was like, I gave you 10 minutes because it's not easy to break down all of that food over the course of an entire day. So good, Abby. Okay. So questions, comments, concerns about what we just did for the caloric breakdown. How it all flows together. You know, obviously you guys had used the power of Google's. Now, what was the site that you guys used? What was the site that you guys used? Nice. So personally, honestly guys, half the time I just go, so. And from there, not only do you get the nutrition information straight up, but there's all of the data you guys need that you can literally just copy and paste, okay? Now, one thing, while you're going through and copying and pasting in that information, you want to go ahead and effectively put that into like Excel in a way that you can really make sense of it pretty quickly and then reorganize it. So like, don't worry about this. This is just a data set that we're currently working with for some research that myself and uh, Ihor are doing. Take a look there. His, his laptop is in the Russian. I don't know what he said there. I'm afraid to look in that tab, but it's there. So that's cool. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to that slide with the Raisin Bran information, okay? So notice the serving size is actually a full cup. So from here, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to copy. Actually, no, I'm going to copy it all. Let's see. Let's see how this goes, okay? So control C, I'm gonna go back over here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna right click and then notice it keeps the formatting or just mass. mass. Okay, woohoo. You know, that's, that's cool and all. Of course, it's gonna be a pain in the butt. You're gonna copy and paste it there. And then we're in do is control copy again. So control C, and then I'm gonna hit right. And then what I'm gonna do is click over here on transpose. So now I can go ahead and put that across. Okay. So notice it's got everything in the one serving up there, but then I can just go ahead and make that the size that I want so I can see what's going on. That's too bad, something got kicked out. So from here, you know, I would just go ahead and, you know, put say food and then raisin brand. And then I can go ahead and just make my totals at the bottom for everything that I did for that day. And that's just gonna make it a lot easier for you guys when you're doing your tracking. Cause remember, you're gonna do two separate blocks of four days of every single food or beverage you ingested over that period. So, if you're on IV nutrition, don't worry about it because something's going on that I don't want you guys to be stressing during that period of time, but go ahead and put in there, okay, like here's all the calories I had, but notice here it gives me the fat, polyunsaturated monos, et cetera, and I can go and paste that in. So anybody have any questions? There's a lot of different options out there. Good points, guys. Bring up using my fitness pal. Um, I'm sure I know like Live Strong has got their own stuff, Sparks People. Thank you, Brent. And eatthismuch.com uh, from Randall. So you're going to have a lot of different ones that you can use. Obviously, guys, I'm a big fan of the ones that give you the values to the tenth of a degree. So notice the actual calories is boom. Through, and notice this is from Healthline. So differing uh, groups will vary on how they're going to approximate everything. So questions, comments, concerns, 
about anything that we have covered this evening, guys, or anything that's supposed to be coming up. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna go ahead and talk about is your guys's research paper. Remember, the first is meant to be, you write a review over a review paper. Uh, no, effectively, it just has to be somehow related to nutrition. So this can be supplementation, this can be specific types of diets, this can be specific types of interventions, something that happens to have anything to do with effectively the wonders of bioenergetics. You could be talking about uh, genetic uh, abnormalities that cause issues with processing certain uh, macro or micronutrients. Like you could talk about maple syrup urine disease where people literally are unable to process three different amino acids. So it's gonna obviously cause some issues. So any of you guys right now, who's got an idea for something they would like to go ahead and do a review on? And I'm gonna use yours as the example that we're gonna work through and obviously everyone else can see it. So you're welcome. All right, so I'm imagining that's blood, glucose levels, and we're gonna go with aerobic athletes just because that's probably gonna be our best bet to start. So magnesium the athlete, boy, that has a whole lot to do with it. No, it doesn't. Okay, acute and late glycemia in athletes with type one diabetes, okay. Now, this is probably not a review article. It is peer reviewed, meaning people that have terminal degrees have looked at it and been like, okay, this is appropriate. This deserves to be published, but it's probably not a true view. Exercise and glucose metabolism, person with diabetes, perspectives on the role for continuous blood glucose monitoring. This might be a review article. So we're going to open that tab. Uh, current sports medicine reports. So this definitely sounds like a review of diabetes and the competitive athlete. So patient management, probably not. Update on management of type one and type two diabetes and athletes. So we'll go ahead and click on this guy. Journal of Diabetes Science Technology. So obviously this is a journal. It said like bodybuilding.com or Shape Magazine, throw it in the garbage, we need to go somewhere that matters. Okay, published in 2009. So, okay, it's a little 10 years old. It's got some age to it. Okay, so we read the abstract. Yeah, notice right here, this statement, this review aims, that should be like, okay, I am reading a review article, okay? Whereas if we go back to this one, take a look, okay, methods. We have a population, notice in a blinded fashion in 11 trained athletes with type one diabetes during two sedentary days and two days in which 45 minutes of afternoon continuous moderate intensity exercise occurred, either with or without intermittent high intensity exercise. Results, conclusions. This is a peer reviewed article, but it is not a review article. It is simply, obviously, an analysis of one, this is one study. That's what this is. And that is not what you guys are doing for your first paper. Your second paper, because now you've read a review you're going to be writing your own review on the area that you find interesting. Ooh, impact factor. So that's actually pretty easy. So who, what do we got here? Do, do, do. Literally, ready? Boom, 3.08. Just gotta Google it. It's one search away. Impact factor gives you an idea effectively of like the quality of the research, or not necessarily the quality, but essentially how well that journal is cited and being used in other research. So diabetes and competitive athletes, okay.
and a detailed review of the potential complications. So you usually see the word review and notice it's not like here are our subjects, here's the sample we looked at. It could say we analyzed 20 or 30 um, research articles. And that's how you know, once again, it's a review of the information. So questions, comments, concerns. None? You guys good? You guys okay with calling it a night? You feel like you've gotten your learn on enough? I've bored you to tears. We've got the basics of what's going on with essential, non-essential, and conditionally essential, upper limits of intakes, too little of an intake, and how we need to be in that Goldilocks zone. But obviously we need more context to figure out who we're working with. And then how we're gonna read those food labels, how I've got my hangups about lies on there, and then obviously how we're going to break down somebody's diet. Any, any questions, guys? Yes, just the topic. And you're going to say like, you know, obviously, you know, Lucas threw out his idea. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. It's going to be kind of hard to find it. <laughs> it's okay, guys. Welcome to the joys of living in this new era. Guys, if you lose connection, um, if you get kicked out, my first thought whenever you guys lose connection is the fact that, you know, something went wrong with your connection. Not that you're like, you know what, this guy, I'm out. It's, we're all getting through this guys and it sucks. You know, whether you're listening to me now or you're listening to the recording later. Um, so we're just trying to do our best. Yes. If you guys need to change your topic, that's fine. That's why I want to hear what your idea is. And I might be like, it's a good idea, but I don't think that's been done. Or that's way too broad, you're gonna lose your mind. Or maybe try to look at this side of it instead. That's why I want you guys to submit that because it's two points. All I have to do is like, I want to look at how protein makes you awesome. Like, well, let's go with the positive effects of protein on strength athletes or something along those lines. Like, let's narrow that down a little bit. Yeah, sweet, go for it. You're more than welcome to do that. And if you want to do how protein won't kill you, absolutely fine. Look at Jose Antonio's work and a lot of stuff around there. And then also how, um, oh gosh, the tyrant from The Biggest Loser, uh, Jillian Michaels, who talked out of a wrong orifice, talking about how protein's bad for you recently on social media. One of my friends shared it to me and it was like, oh God, this is a dumpster fire. If you guys want to just debunk something for extra credit, you can give me all the references on how she's wrong. Hence, uh, start with Jose Antonio's work. But that's just me. So guys, thank you guys for coming tonight. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. Wash your hands. And um, yeah, I will see you guys next week. And we're going to obviously keep on trucking. Interesting. Interesting. So hmm. I would suggest dosing with a simple carbohydrate within the first 20 minutes of, or within 20 minutes when you're starting your warm up. Yeah. I